Hello and welcome to CBC Arts Exhibitionists. I'm your host, Amanda Paris. We are currently living through a cultural reckoning. Over the past few weeks, the issue of systemic anti-Black racism has become a mobilizing force. People have taken to the streets demanding change from institutions. None of the issues are new. What is new is the amount of attention being paid to them. Today, we are dedicating our entire episode to Black artists who are trying to create in the midst of an uprising. I'm sitting down with the legendary theater director, Philip Aiken, to talk about the long game of art and activism. Khadijah Morley is using lino cuts to explore her struggle with hope. A multidisciplinary artist is discovering a space of calm in a few Hail Marys. And a poet is speaking urgent truths to systems of power. It's 30 minutes of reflection and resistance. This is CBC Arts Exhibitionists. Recently, Ashley C. Ford tweeted a list of goals she made a few weeks ago. The list included creative ideas and professional ambitions. She concluded with, now I wake up every day and the only goal is to get to the next one. Racism steals lives and dreams. Khadijah Morley is a visual artist who is also struggling to think about the future. Using her lino cut practice, she wanted to create an image that conveyed hope. But as you'll see at a time like this, that task is easier said than done. Hi, I'm Khadija Morley. I'm an artist from Toronto, Ontario. For the last couple of years, you know, I've been dealing with my own personal identity politics, especially as a Black woman. And often our voices are excluded from the canon of Western art history, so. As I've started to shift my practice uh, more into printmaking, I felt an urgency to reinsert my likeness back into the work um, because I want the people that I'm making work for to at least be able to see some sort of representation, you know, and also humanize an experience, you know. So this is my workspace, which is actually the corner of my bedroom. Um, this is the wall beside it where I usually put up works in progress or things that inspire me. Uh, the most important thing in my place for me is my bookshelf. There's a lot of my reference, you know, my theory, all that. And my CDs, I've been collecting CDs for years, so. This is my roommate who sleeps in this box over here. <laughs> Um, so because I don't have access to like a printmaking studio, I'm going to be working on a piece of uh, linoleum. It's the most accessible thing I can do at the moment because I'm just carving and then I can print it by hand. Um, so I carve it with this knife and then I'll show you how I print it later. So the image is carved already, and I um, already did some test prints on newsprint to see if I was okay with it. Uh, so that's usually the process, you know, you kind of test it out multiple times before you get the perfect print. So I'm going to print it on better paper, uh, probably yellow. So this is the end result. I feel like it's quite obvious that the Imagery that I'm referencing was prompted by what happened in Minneapolis, specifically the flames, um, you know, and witnessing the burning police station. That's what I feel like should be done to abusive institutions, you know, just start fresh and start new. Emotionally draining to produce work on a subject matter that I'm not new to, um, something that's prevalent in my life something that I constantly witness. And it's unfortunate that the spectacle of black death has sort of brought fresh new eyes 
that were often complicit um, to this discussion. You know, we're here 365 days of the year, living this experience, constantly fighting for our voices to be heard. You know, so that's all I got. Hi, my name is Debbie Young, Anita Africa, and I am a Jamaican Canadian dub poet, theatre interventionist, and decolonial scholar. Currently doing my PhD research in London, UK, where I'm looking at decolonial performance, praxis, and pedagogy in theatre. I am your exhibitionist in residence this week. And throughout the show, you're going to see excerpts of a dub poem that I wrote with my children, Moon and Phoenix. It's a fictionalized conversation with them that is not so fictional about anti-Black racism, about colonization, colonialism. And how do you have that conversation with your children knowing that they're going into a future for themselves? It's a challenging one, and the piece is an attempt to do so as lovingly and as compassionately as possible. Mom, why are bad things called black and good things are called white? Does that mean I'm bad because I'm black, not white? Mom, why did the enslavement of black people continue for so long? Did black people get paid after slavery ended? How did they carry on? Mom, how come they say at school the black kids are dropouts? Does that mean they will pull me out of school? I don't want to be a dropout. How come they shot the black boy? Nobody did a thing about it. Does that mean I can get shot too and you will live without me? Coming up, I sit down with legendary theater director, Philip Aiken. I believe we have to build our own power. My commitment to you, my children, our future, is to teach you and love you and celebrate your magnificence, your blackness, your, your beauty, your courage, your intelligence, and to guide you through this childhood as best as I can, giving you all the tools that I have so that you can withstand the inevitable trials and tribulations of this life. Long before it was the go-to hashtag of every corporation, Philip Aiken has been demonstrating that Black Lives Matter for decades. As the artistic director of Obsidian Theatre Company, Philip has supported thousands of Black theatre artists to tell their stories and manifest their talents on stage and behind the scenes. I know because I'm one of them. My debut play was co-produced by his company. Philip is retiring from Obsidian, but before he goes, we're gonna sit down and talk about his time as the leader of one of the only black theater companies in the country. Hi, Philip Aiken, thank you so much for joining me here. Well, hi, Amanda Paris, so lovely to be here. <laughs> I love that we're on first and last name basis as well too. <laughs> <laughs> we're a power couple, that's what it's I know. all about. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm very excited to talk to you because uh, I mean, even if we weren't living through the situation that we're living through right now, this is already such a monumental moment because you are stepping down from your position as artistic director of Obsidian. In this moment that does feel like a bit of a cultural reckoning. What kind of changes do you want to see the industry make at this point? Well, I, I'm afraid I'm a bit of an outlier with uh, general, general beliefs. Uh, I think that if Black artists spent as much time building, supporting, creating, developing Black work, as they do trying to change white organizations into being something that they aren't, we would be further ahead. Mm -hmm. I think the biggest failure I've had at Obsidian was I actually bought into this idea about changing people. It was, it was all nonsense. It was garbage. What we should have done was said, 
we're going to make Obsidian the powerhouse. That was a, a huge error, I believe. I believe we have to build our own power. We have to create our own state. We have to make black art our 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 mainstream thing to do. You can you can spend your time and your life and your energy trying to fix those organizations, and that's your choice. You know, I say I wish that all that energy was put into help building. Black theater. History's happening right now. Mm -hmm. Black history's happening right now. But we tend to have this idea that only, only what's behind us is history. And this is actually more to the history of, let's say, somebody my age in my life. What are your hopes without, you know, trying to impose a particular vision on the future of Obsidian? What are your hopes for the company moving forward, especially in this in this particular moment of social distancing and trying to reimagine what theater is gonna look like in general, what are your hopes specifically for Obsidian? Um, I don't know how to solve a lot of those problems and I'm not even gonna to pretend to try. But what I, what I will say is, I have always believed that we put black artists first above anybody else I don't care who else, black artists come first. Black artists need to get the best top level, platinum level treatment every single time. They need to be paid better than anybody else. They need, the, they need to get the respect. So as, as long, my, I would say to anybody going forward, as long as you put black artists first, and sacrifice to make sure they're first, then, then what will come out will be great. I don't, I actually don't have, I mean, I've helped lots of people I don't like, right? <laughs> but it's, it's not about that. It's about, did, do, did they have a decent project? Did they need the help? If I'm going to put black people first, does it, my personal opinion is not the, the guiding light here. It's what's going to help that artist move forward. Mm -hmm. So that would be my hope going forward is that people will be stalwart and unyielding and, and ferocious in the defense of black artists. Well, I love that. I love that so much. You've said too many things that I want to write down, put on a t-shirt, yell at the top of the CBC. <laughs> um, <laughs> but thank you so much, Philip. It's so wonderful to talk to you. So wonderful to share virtual space with you. And uh, thank you for all that you've done and all that you continue to do and all the ways that you've helped to make my personal artistic journey so much easier and so much more joyous as well, too. Well, thank you. The only thing that I would ask of you then where the heck is your second play? So you're really going to call me out like that, right? Here. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. It's one and done is not good enough. You're, you're, you, know, you know how talented you are. You need to put your mind in gear and give us another play. I'll direct it next time. Go ahead. Oh, my God. Well, okay. I'm, this has been taped and recorded, and it is being held <laughs> down. So I, clearly Amanda has to write and Clearly Philip is directing it. That's it. It's done. Yeah. <laughs> Coming up, we meet the conceptual artist finding calm in the words of the Hail Mary. Here I am, a mother with you, my black sons, lost for words to explain how systemic racism is connected to slavery. And all I really want to do is to hold you and tell you how much I love you and that it will all be okay. But I know, I know that that's not enough. From a global pandemic to a global revolution, 2020 has been a year filled with anxiety and upheaval, fear and adrenaline. It's no wonder that everyone is trying to find their coping mechanisms. For some, it comes with meditation, for others through exercise. And for this next artist, it's been found in a few Hail Marys. Hello, I'm Erica DeFreitas and I'm a conceptual visual artist based in Scarborough, Ontario. I'm able to create in spaces where I feel most comfortable 
and so my studio is in my home and I have been creating the most recent body of work from this space here, my bedroom. I love to collect things and this is a, a very small collection of Virgin Marys that I've accumulated over the past few years. So something I noticed is that I started to have a really hard time falling asleep. And eventually a strategy that I started to utilize was I started to recite the Hail Mary prayer over and over and over again until I fell asleep. As someone who doesn't identify as religious, my relationship to the Virgin Mary is one that I've been quite interested in. It's a interest and a relationship with her that I don't feel the need to necessarily explain. And a lot of that comes down to the fact that I really can't explain it other than she makes me feel grounded. And that's what I needed to lean on in that moment. I realized that I actually wanted to see what this looked like. And so I decided to, to sit at my desk and to type out the re recitation of the prayer. What I started to realize is that in this visual and the recitation of this prayer was a strong reflection on ritual, on hope, on repetition, and on dailiness. What you'll notice is that each meditation exists on its own page and they're dated. Each page has a different, a different look. And that's because uh, this process is entirely intuitive based. There is no plan other than to recite the Hail Mary and to type it until I've gotten to the point where I feel like my mind is at rest and I'll be able to get a night's sleep. The past few months have been very challenging for me. I lost a family member in late April. And then the constant, constant, and this is like pre-COVID-19, loss of life from the Black community. It, it's so heavy. It's so heavy and it spreads so deep and so wide. And yes, the personal has impacted this body of work that I'm creating, but the communal sense of loss has also impacted my sleepless nights and the sense of the specter of death always hovering and this anxiety of uncertainty. If you have an artist that you think should be on CBC Arts Exhibitionist, send me a message on social media. Our handle is at CBC Arts. Before we go, I want to give the final word to a poet who's using her words in all their rawness and urgency to speak truth to power. Her poem is called The Original Pandemic. Tune in next time for another deep dive into the captivating work of Canadian artists. Peace. In times like these, black grief comes with no moment of silence, no time to process. The five stages of grief are accelerated when you act as mourner, coroner, SIU, funeral home, and tombstone. I asked my father how he felt today, and he said, sick and tired. But he said it like it's just another day, like it's all the same different time and place, like he's numb to this accelerated cycle of grief. He said, 
when you've had to repeat yourself again and again, how can they blame us for when our voices raise, when our tones change, after asking the same questions, after all the investigations swept under rugs, floorboards, buried, covered in flowers, dewy with sap that have Canada's not that bad written on its very stems, because Canadians are known for saying sorry, but never meaning it, when you force forgiveness from your victims, no wonder there's protests in a pandemic when danger rolls off of black people's backs the same way black lives matter rolls off of tongues when it's convenient because anti-black racism has been the pandemic long before the one we're living through. So what do you do to stop the spread? You can start by listening, removing your body from comfort, Looking at this country's broken reflection and finding yourself in its mirror shards, taking each limb apart to expose what's been planted in you. There will be no more saying, let's make it better for the next generation like mine is a write-off. This time, white tears won't wash away the trending topics like they normally do. Because it's your turn to be angry, it's your turn to repeat yourself. It's your turn to scream through all the white noise until you feel your voices raise, your tones change, until you learn what it feels like to be sick and tired. So say something and let Black people have a moment because you had more than enough of those.